Good morning, everyone. We're kicking off today with a very important topic, one that is close to all of our hearts in the sense that we all lived through it, and we're still processing, processing the pandemic, frankly. And it is the subject of our next session is the impact of pandemics on conflict, humanitarian relief in conflict zones, trends, challenges, and strategies for the 21st century. The world is becoming increasingly dangerous in the 21st century and the number and severity of armed conflicts, natural disasters and disease outbreaks are consistently on the rise. Just yesterday, we saw yet another earthquake in Turkey. Climate is exacerbating these global trends. So we have a very important panel that will come up and discuss all of this for us, moderated by Mrs. Rebecca Milner. It's my pleasure to invite Rebecca Milner to the stage now who will introduce our panelists and kick off today's session. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking the custodian of the two holy mosques, King Solomon bin Abdulaziz and His Excellency Abdullah al-Rabia, the Supervisor General of the King Solomon Humanitarian Aid and Relief Center for the ongoing partnership and generous contributions of more than $11 million to International Medical Corps, which has enabled us to reach millions of people in need globally. Welcome to the panel today, The Impact of Pandemics in Conflict. Thank you for coming. Uh, today we will hear from experts across the health and humanitarian sectors to help us understand the key challenges disease outbreaks pose lessons learned from the past several years, and to discuss how we can apply these learnings to a changing future. This conversation is being held at a critical moment. The need for humanitarian assistance around the world is rising, and as we repeatedly noted yesterday, 339 million people around the world need assistance and protection. The rising need indicates a larger issue. According to the World Bank, Last year, 850 million people lived in countries facing high or medium intensity conflict. For communities in Ukraine, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and others, these conflicts have wide reaching consequences as they disrupt health systems, supply chains, drive an exodus of healthcare workers, increase food insecurity, and break down social and economic systems. Climate change is increasing pressure on the availability of food, water, healthcare, and other resources, and low income communities are bearing the brunt. Today, the Horn of Africa is facing the most severe drought in recent history putting more than 36 million people at risk. Many of those facing severe water shortages and food insecurity in the region are also affected by conflicts. And we must acknowledge the current crisis in Turkey and Syria caused by the earthquakes and the ongoing conflict in northern Syria that has complicated the delivery of humanitarian assistance. At the same time, communities wor worldwide are grappling with the impact of disease outbreaks of epidemic or pandemic proportions, which are both fueled by and complicate recovery from conflict. In Syria, more than 52,000 suspected cases of cholera were reported between August and November of last year, at a time when the civil war has left nearly 30% of the public health facilities non-functional. In Yemen, two and a half million people have been impacted by a cholera outbreak that began in 2016 and continues to this day. The Democratic Republic of Congo has experienced repeated outbreaks of Ebola in recent years, killing thousands. And of course, over the past three years, we have all faced a worldwide pandemic that has disrupted every element of our lives and our work. Disease outbreaks are challenging the ability of the humanitarian community to effectively provide aid. And as many of us experienced during the early phase of the COVID pandemic, restrictions on movement across and within borders made reaching conflict affected communities incredibly difficult. At the same time, conflict remains a significant barrier to preventing the spread of disease outbreaks. Research from the Ebola outbreak in the DRC suggests that population level vaccine campaigns were less effective in areas that had recently experienced conflict. The intersecting crisis of conflict, climate change, and pandemics 
have both drastically exacerbated humanitarian need and exposed critical gaps and weaknesses. Today, we will explore these key challenges and look forward to the strategies that will shape the future of humanitarian response. With that backdrop, I'd like to welcome our esteemed panelists, if you'd all join me up here. Um, as we began to pull this panel together, uh, we realized that International Medical Corps' work uh, complements and intersects with all of our panelists' work. And this, of course, brought to mind the power of partnerships. No one organization or entity or government can do this alone. We must all work together. So I'm delighted to welcome everyone. I don't know, you're so far away. <laughs> Come closer. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists one by one. Uh, they will be making opening remarks. Dr. Ali, do you want to join me down here? Um, you want to start? Okay. Um, we're very honored to have His Excellency, Dr. Ali Adnan, uh, the Minister of Health from Somalia, here with us today. Uh, uh, Dr. Ali, would you like to make your opening remarks? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. His Excellencies, uh, Head of States, Ministers, and all participants, good morning. Uh, as you may know, uh, Somalia is fighting at the forefront against the recurrent droughts, multiple disease outbreak, conflict, and climate changes, and COVID-19 pandemic all these warring disruptions are constantly at the forefront. Every day, multiple tragedies impact the life of our people. As I speak, over half of our population, 8 million exactly, are in need of humanitarian assistance. COVID-19 pandemic is not yet over in Somalia, like the rest of the world. We continue to see low number of cases and death, signifying that the virus presence has not stopped, but perhaps with low intensity. The fact is that we have close to 45% of our population fully vaccinated. We may see upsurge of cases in the event of circulation of any new variant of concern. The COVID-19 pandemic, the climate shocks, and the conflicts have taught us lessons that building and investing strong primary health care workforce is crucial for improving service delivery and health care coverage. The migration of skilled health work workers from Somalia due to protracted conflicts and resulting shortage have adversely affected service delivery at all levels of our health care. Today, we have less than 10 health care workers per 10,000 population, which is far below than the lower, th lower threshold of WHO workforce standards of 23 per 10,000. Therefore, sustainable investment is needed in building health workforce that can reduce the current shortage and ensure that our health workers have the required skills and knowledge to deliver good quality health care at all levels. Climate change has proven to be the biggest driver of internal displacement in Somalia. The ongoing drought, which is the result of five consecutive failed rainy seasons, has displaced over one million people in Somalia. About 40% of internal displacement in Somalia is climate-related. For us, climate is real. The therefore, climate change for us is not something that will happen in the future. It is happening now. The agriculture and livestock loss will hit hard on economy of our country. The agricultural sector contributes to 65 of 
our GDP, 65% of our GBD, and livestock contributes 40% of our export in it. The emergence of new pathogens and resurgence of old diseases, which are proven consequences of climate change, will mean that more lives will be lost from preventable causes. In 2016, Somalia conducted joint external evaluation of its capacities to prevent, detect, and respond to epidemics and other public health emergencies. The assessment revealed that we had limited capacity in almost all the assessed areas. Since then, Somalia had taken bold decisions and steps toward improving its capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to epidemics and other public health emergencies, among others. These include strengthening of the routine vaccination program and conducting timely reactive vaccination campaigns to reduce the outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases such as measles and cholera. Expanding the disease surveillance system from sentinel sites abroad to all health facilities in the country. Establishing PCR testing capacity and genomic, consequence, uh, genomic sequencing capacity to all the states in the country. And also establishing public health emergency operations all states in the country. Establishing the frontline field epidemiology training program to equip frontline health workers with outbreak surveillance and response knowledge and skills. Implementation of integrated disease surveillance and response strategy aimed at integrating multiple disease surveillance systems into single multi-disease surveillance system. The above are conceptualized as low-cost interventions. For example, Somali is currently rolling out implementation of the integrated disease surveillance and response strategy for strengthening surveillance through integration other low-cost but high-impact interventions we implemented include solar-powered medical-grade oxygen, which is now installed in multiple tertiary health facilities in Somalia. The Community Health Worker Program is another low-cost, high-impact intervention that has been implemented as a measure of impact for 2.7% of all confirmed COVID-19 cases in 2021 and 2022 were detected by community health workers. Our plan is gradually scaling up the community health workers program to all accessible states, regions, and districts. The One Health approach, which links human health, animal health, and environment, will be key to addressing also future challenges in humanitarian response to epidemics and pandemics as well as a humanitarian crisis arising out of climate shocks. For humanitarian response to be effective, we need to engage communities, civil society organizations, religious leaders, women and youth groups, and the media. Often their voices are not heard. Often we design an intervention or a delivery model that are not culturally sensitive or context responsive. Our recent experience with the engagement of non-state actors is the last three, in the last three of years of the pandemic has been effective. The humanitarian actors have worked with communities and local NGOs to ensure access to this area. Impartiality is key to gain the trust of the communities. We need to bring together partners from across the humanitarian system to advocate for the survival well-being and dignity of people affected by a crisis and for the safety and security of aid, aid workers. Whenever and wherever people are in need, there are other, others who help them. There are others who help them. The affected people themselves are always the first to respond when the disaster strikes together with their local authorities and a global community that supports them as they, as they recover. Far from the spotlight and out of the headlines, they come together to ease suffering and bring hope to their communities. We therefore need to strengthen resiliency at community level and make sure that 
disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation programs benefit the communities. The One Health approach was conceptualized as a global public health strategy that encourages interdisciplinary collaboration and communication on health at the human, human animal environmental interface. If we invest more on One Health, we will protect the environment and our ecosystem, strengthen collaboration of multiple disciplines, working locally, nationally, and globally to attain optimal health of people, animals, and our environment. One Health issues have gained greatest traction in terms of climate change and its adverse effects on the health of humans, animals, and the environment. Climate change compromises the ecological and environmental integrity of living systems. Climate change is termed as threat multiplier in that it adversely affects infectious diseases, zoonosis, food security, food safety, and local, regional, and global responses to these threats. Aligning One Health with climate change could establish the environmental sector in One Health Triangle. We should do more to support One Health involving the public health, veterinary, public health, and environmental sectors. The One Health approach is particularly relevant for food and water safety, nutrition, the control of zoonotic disease, pollution management, and combating antimicrobial resistance. If we neglect investing in One Health, we do it at our own peril. We have already seen what all these treaties are boosting to the economy and sustainable development of our country, like of, of country like Somalia. Our aim is to reduce poverty by 2030. Nearly two thirds of our population, 69 percent, currently live on less than two dollars a day, not enough to cover their basic needs. 1.8 million children which comprises 45% of children in the country face acute severe malnutrition. These are not just numbers. These are our reminders that we may fail if we do not believe that we can be only as strong as our weakest links. The pandemic of COVID-19 has given us this stark lesson. What gives us hope is that the humanitarian response is judging. We are turning crisis into opportunities. We are talking about resiliency now more than being dependent on aid. Our humanitarian partners and donor agencies are also realizing that we need to build the institutions and support system building more while we are also address the acute humanitarian need. Dr. Ali? I, th I think that we'll save that question for, okay. at, for the end. Um, let me introduce our next uh, okay. panelist, okay. His Excellency, Mr. Sultan Al Shamsi. He is the Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation for International Development Affairs for the United Arab Emirates. Welcome. Uh, you try again? Sound? Hello? Ah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> well, I would like to thank you and for the organizing very important session. I would like to thank King Salman Center, uh, Dr. Abdullah Rabia, for this important gathering. It was really ple my pleasure to attend the third uh, conference. I was in the first and the second. And I think it's really timely. As, as, as you've seen, this is an earthquake in, in, in Syria and Turkey. And even yesterday, there was another earthquake. It's timely to come together and, and speak about how we can better respond and how we can shape the future of the humanitarian response. Thanks. Okay, great. And representing the World Health Organization is Dr. Hanan Balki. She's the Assistant Director General for Antimicrobial Resistance and the Access to Medicines and Health Products Division. Uh, welcome, Dr. Balki. 
Thank you very much, Rebecca. I hope the voice is clear. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. It's uh, a great pleasure and an honor to be in my hometown uh, participating in this session, and I would like to extend my sincere appreciation uh, to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and His Excellency Dr. Abdullah Rabia and IMC for organizing this specific session. I think uh, you wanted a few words of introduction. I think uh, from the WHO perspective, it, it becomes very important that uh, as the global health organization uh, dealing with 194 member states in the middle of a pandemic and also uh, facing um, tragedies, whether it's from climate change, man-made or natural-made disasters compounding the, uh, the, the challenges for access to health care and medicines. And I think this panel is going to be uh, a great panel to emphasize on how are we going to move forward in the next years to come so that we are actually uh, ready for the current challenges, whether, again, they are natural ones or man-made ones, and how are we going to be prepared, and I would like to touch on that maybe in the upcoming questions. So uh, thank you again for having me on the panel and looking forward to the discussion. Great. Uh, and then next we have Dr. Valerie Bimo, the Deputy Director for the Global Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Bimo, on your birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for this is a special day for me to be with all of you. How many of you had had your birthday? Your birthday with so many people <laughs> guests. Then I'm honored to be here today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also honored for the Kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia for inviting us and create this magnificent event and Curse Relief. Um, I'll take the perspective of the philanthropy. As, um, as a Gates Foundation, we know we are one of the biggest philanthropy in the world, but we also know that um, the money is just a drop in the, the big ocean of the needs. And as a philanthropy, we see our funding as catalytic, as essential, because we, as a philanthropy private sector, we can take risks where others cannot. And we see the value of innovation, of bringing, and we saw it with COVID and the other big crises where we can bring that. But we also have the power of our voice to bring partnership. Earlier, um, Ms. Honorable was mentioning how we have been partnering with the Saudi, with LLF, to create, um, we can bring together big government, we can bring together private sector, we can bring big academia to, to work on that. And COVID has shown us that we cannot do it alone and we have to be together. And uh, as one of um, African proverbs said, if you want to go fast, go alone, and if you want to go far, go together. And I think this for me is the big piece of how do we get to the COVID and the impact of COVID will just affect all of us unless we get together. And that will be the first piece for okay. me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bimo. Uh, and then we have uh, Mrs. Adele Koder, uh, UNICEF's Regional Director for the Middle East and North Africa. Good Welcome. morning, Good morning. Uh, Rebecca, thank you very much. And uh, I'm really, I would like to start by uh, sincerely thanking the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and uh, His Excellency Dr. Rabia for hosting this third uh, Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum. Um, for us as, uh, as a child's agency in the Middle East and North Africa, we really find this topic of utmost relevance because this region has around 79 million people in need of humanitarian assistance, including 35 million children. This is a very young population in the region. And uh, I think the, the, there are a number of elements um, that make it very relevant. 
The first is that this region really has probably the highest number of a humanitarian crisis that have lasted for a very long time. So we have conflicts that have been happening for so many years, whether it is the conflict in, uh, or the situation of crisis in Yemen, in Syria, and in, in other countries as well. That's a very important element. Second is that this region is very much prone to natural hazards. I think we all know about the earthquake that has been happening and is still continuing with the aftershocks. It's also a region prone to climate change and water scarcity and water scarcity is linked to uh, health outbreaks and to epidemics. It has also lived through very difficult COVID times that impacted the health systems, and Dr. Um, Hanan spoke about that. And, um, and then also the economic deterioration that many countries in this region have been witnessing over the past, I would say, two years. So all these conditions and uh, really make, make this uh, topic that we are discussing today very relevant because it is one emergency on top of the other. So I'm looking forward to uh, the interesting discussion and to the distinguished panelists that are with us today. Thank you. And finally, we have Mohammed al Sati, Senior Advisor to the President, Islamic Development Bank. Well, assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to join my colleagues also in extending sincere thanks and appreciation to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and to KS Relief, headed by His Excellency Dr. Abdiya and the team, and also thanks to IMC for organizing this session. Now, uh, let me start by mentioning that the Islamic Development Bank being a development institution is really focusing on helping member countries for their development needs moving into the SDGs. However, the session and the timing is, is right because of the challenging challenges facing many of our member countries of the ISDB being LDMCs, least developed countries, or even fragile and conflict areas without mentioning the countries. Having said that, let me just start by maybe kind of like a philosophical point. When we're talking about conflicts and fragility, yes, we're addressing physical conflicts like what's happening in Syria or Ukraine or Yemen and other countries also in Africa, etc., which is we need to do something about it. But also equally important to highlight, there are also some philosophical and ideological conflicts. And I give two examples. The example of polio eradication in Pakistan, where the international community and also the Gates Foundation, WHO, the ISDB, they were willing to help, but there was some resistance from some areas about the vaccines. So this is something that has to be taken into consideration. Another example is what's happening currently in Afghanistan, and we're all sympathizing with Afghanistan, where everybody's trying to help, and we feel that women and children are really the major constituents in the country, yet we're seeing everybody trying to help. At the same time, there is resistance for female education and going back to work. These are also has to be taken really seriously to be addressed. At the same time, we're witnessing more fragility and more conflicts. The moment we finish from a financial crisis and we want to take some relief and try to go back into the development and getting into more growth and prosperity, we're being hit by another conflict. Most recently, the COVID pandemic, where I think this time, uniquely, it's not only a region or a country or an area, it is the whole world that was hit by the COVID. Definitely, we all suffered. The whole world suffered. At the end of the day, yes, maybe there were some solutions, lessons learned, and even some, I would say, some benefits at the same time. But we cannot underestimate the damage that has been affected by the COVID pandemic on everything from health to education to livelihood to uh, job creation or job losses, etc. Even we're witnessing countries that are Unfortunately, we're going into a kind of a positive growth in their GDPs, and now, unfortunately, they're going, back, going down. So now, being a development institution, 
although we focus more into the development and self-reliance of our member countries as uh, an MDB, however, we cannot ignore, and His Excellency, my boss, Dr. Mohamed al Jasser, mentioned yesterday that although we are not a humanitarian assistant institution, we are more a development institution, but there is no way that you can isolate between what's happening in the member countries and the fragility areas where we have to do some humanitarian assistance and bring in capacity. But at the end of the day, for an MDB like the ISDB is to move more into development, more into self-reliance, building capacity, bringing more prosperity, and going back into the development. So we are here to complement whatever the humanitarian organization, UN, NGOs, etc., by helping them right now. But honestly, our intention in our member countries and the conflict areas is to move more into sustainability, development, prevention of all of these shocks and all of that. So let me stop here and hopefully later on maybe we can address some specific questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, now I think we'd like to kind of dive into the topic and talk about how uh, pandemic and other disease outbreaks continue to impact uh, communities. And, and Dr. Ali, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, the Somalia, Somali government's um, focus on building resilience at the community level. Maybe you could talk a little bit about um, some of those strategies and, and what it looks like at the community level in Somalia. What are, some of, what, are, what are some of the things that the Somalia government is doing to help build resilience at the community level? Yes, uh, community level, uh, now the government of Somalia is uh, struggling to also relieve the acute humanitarian emergencies while also uh, trying to also to develop and sustain the development and resilience system. And we made an uh, example, uh, the program of community health worker, uh, which is a high impact intervention and uh, was implemented uh, as measure for 2.7 percent of all confirmed community COVID-19 cases in 2021 were detected by community health workers. So uh, we implemented also public health emergency operation centers that will survey will be responsible for surveillance all over the country. We also. Uh, implemented uh, frontline field epidemiology training program to equip frontline health workers with outbreak surveillance and response in knowledge and skills. We also implemented integrated disease surveillance and response strategy that aiming at integrating multiple disease surveillance systems into single multi-disease surveillance system. So. Uh, we are trying to build the health infrastructure and health system in Somalia. We experienced collapse of government systems for more than uh, three decades, right. 30 years. So now we are trying to reestablish uh, government institutions, especially health system infrastructure, and strengthen it. Uh, we are facing more challenges, uh, conflicts, buffered, recurrent droughts, uh, multiple disease outbreaks. We are facing multiple challenges. And, and above that, we are facing uh, war against terrorist Al Shabaab. Mm -hmm. Now, many areas that liberated from the terror group uh, has did not get any access to a health service or a humanitarian aid for more than 15 years. Right. So now we need to establish the mother and child health centers to, uh, uh, to get service delivery for mothers and infants. Somalia, as we know, uh, is the highest 
uh, number of maternal death and infant death in the world right. is in Somalia. So, large area we liberated from the Shaba, uh, terrorist Al Shabaab did not get any access to health service for more than 15 years. So, the government now, uh, beside the humanitarian aid, the government is trying to build uh, hospitals, to build mother and child health centers, to build the health institutions, health institutions. A lot of hospitals that was functional before 1990, now still are not functioning. Large hospitals in the city Mogadishu, uh, that was referral hospitals before the collapse of the government in 1991, still are not functioning. Mm -hmm. So we are struggling uh, in one side to fight against the Al-Shabaab, struggling on the other side to fight the recurrent droughts and pandemics, fighting on the other side to build the infrastructure of the government, especially health in, uh, infrastructure. Right. So our people now, 69% uh, live on less than $2 per day, which is not enough to cover their basic needs. Right. 1.8 million children, which comprises 45% of children in the country, face acute severe malnutrition. These are not just the numbers, these are our reminders that we may fail if we do not believe that we can be only as strong as our weakest links. Right, yes. right. Well, the specific challenges that Somalia face uh, are mirrored in a lot of countries in the MENA region. Uh, Mrs. Kodor, um, as we broaden that scope a bit and, and talk about uh, some of the countries in the Middle East that are experiencing conflict, why don't you share a little bit about the impact, particularly on, on children and families? Thank you. I think uh, maybe I, I would like to talk about four, um, four really areas of, of impact that we see. I think the first one is, of course, on the physical health of uh, you know, populations, especially children, because usually they are the most vulnerable, but also on the mental health of the people and, uh, and, and the children. And yesterday, actually, I was talking with Dr. Mandari, my colleague, the WHO Regional Director, and we were saying that and even our colleagues who are now on the ground, you know, supporting the, the earthquake response, about how important it is to deal with mental health issues that can leave an impact on the population, and especially on children for a very long time. So I believe this is the first challenge. Maybe the second one, of course, is the burden of increased uh, uh, disease and mortality, which is a result of the conflicts, it's a result of the epidemic and, and of any humanitarian uh, crisis. And the third one, of course, is the overburden on the health systems. Because many of these countries that are experiencing the epidemics, and we, we saw that with COVID, that they were already suffering from weak health systems. And then the COVID came crisis, the COVID crisis came, and now we have the earthquake. So it's one emergency on top of the other that is weakening the health system. And the fourth and last one probably is that we also have to think about the health service providers. And I think the earthquake that happened recently reminded us that the people who are usually the first responders have themselves been affected by the earthquake. And they had to care for themselves before they are able to care for the others. And I think this is something we were also talking with a colleague, with Wafa from IMC this morning, about how much our colleagues who are in the field are also traumatized. They are there to support the others, but at the same time, they find themselves traumatized. So the impact uh, and the challenges on the health are really, uh, and the health systems are really huge. Mm. Well, Mr. Al Shamsi, as as a government leader, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how the UAE responded to the COVID pandemic at home, but also how the UAE played a critical role in providing support to communities around the world. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. 
Well, thank you very much for this uh, question. First of all, we'd like to thank all the humanitarian and health workers on the ground and for um, the, the action they provide, plus uh, coming together with different instruments to, to support. UE was really, uh, I mean, have the, the early warning system, and we've been following up all the cases during the pandemic since December uh, 2019. I mean, uh, and already we have the system in UAE. Yes, we learn a lot. It's very important to build on this experience what we have got actually in UAE. I mean, on, on the, all the testing center, the vaccination programs being uh, made that during the time. It was really important how we can also support other countries. Our support really comes to different ele elements. So when working with the WHO um, as a leading uh, organization in health, also another working with the multi-donors funds like the Gavi and COVAX facility, uh, Global Fund also came uh, and also the uh, allocate 5% uh, to the allocation to support the, the pandemic response. But also, in addition of that, uh, the UAE has a really a good infrastructure of the logistics. Because during the pandemic, one of the difficulties was the lockdown and also everything has been closed. The airports, ports, airline was really closed. All the markets was closed. UAE is the ha has the biggest uh, humanitarian hub in the world as a humanitarian relief, but also we are respond, responded to the many countries providing the PPEs, ventilators, vaccines later on. So uh, we managed to provide assistance to 140 countries, uh, sending thousands of tons. Um, we daily, uh, during that time, have around two to three flights a day to, to the countries. But the most important, I think, uh, how we can really be better prepared. I think we get the experience uh, during the, the pandemic of COVID-19. And we have to work more on, on, the, on this system that's being built. We invested a lot now on the, the, the health system in different minister countries, like building mobile hospitals or hospitals or strengthening the, the capacity of the health workers on the grounds. But also very important to be how they eradicate some diseases, because we've been glad to work with a number of organizations like uh, Gates Foundation to eradicate the polio in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We managed to give vaccination to more than 80 million children, around 600,000 doses to vaccination. So at least we have a uh, future generation with no polio in the future. But the most important, how we can eradicate, how we can be much prepared for uh, the response and to avoid any eruption on the supply chains. The private sector, I think they has uh, get a good experience during the pandemic. They need to expand in the countries. They have to invest in these experience on the also development countries. We have a good middle income countries and low income countries. I think they're really open for, to, for the private sector investment on the health, whether manufacturing the BPEs or vaccination, and also management of the health facilities there. So I think this is the, that we can bring donor, recipient countries, plus private sector with the international organization to work together. Right. It takes us all, right? We all have to be involved. Um, and I mean, th these are all kind of challenges that have been related to the COVID pandemic. But of course, you know, cholera and Ebola and other disease outbreaks are continuing continuing to challenge conflict-affected communities. Um, I mean, maybe, Dr. Bimo, you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges that response agencies are facing, um, and you know, how, what are some of the strategies that we can I implement to adapt to these challenges? Uh, uh, Dr. Bimo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there's a lot of challenges, but I also see it as an opportunity. Right. COVID-19 um, show us that um, we, the world acted individually without solidarity as an independent, and we can't do that. We, we have seen a world where we increasingly be connected to each other, uh, interconnected, and we are a global world. We know that one person in Africa impacted can impact somebody in China or, or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think one of the things that we really realize as we 
look at the world as a global um, entity, there's no real mechanisms to, to come together and to, to have the leaders talking to each other in the terms of pandemic preparedness. And one of the things that the WHO have been leading, especially at the Geneva, I'm glad that I have the assistant uh, um, director to, to lead in the way like how do we work as a solidarity? How do we um, create a pandemic preparedness, a pandemic curve to look at the world in the next one? We know that the next pandemic probably will not have, uh, will not wait for 100 years. It will probably sooner than that. Um, we also know that um, we, in the way, we were lucky to have a pandemic, COVID, who just had uh, less than 1% case fatality rate. And we, we are not sure that the next one will have a so low um, fatality rate. That means that we may have a big disaster. If, as a world, we can come together, having our leaders talk to each other, creating a force that can work together, that can exercise together, plan together, actually will solve a big issue to, to serve not just as a pandemic, but we know the pandemic starts with outbreak, an outbreak that go beyond borders, transnational, regional, and global. How do we start really thinking about that, including strengthening the each country health system? If one country is strong and the other one are not, will not be solving the pandemic. Right. Then the each, and I'm glad to hear from, for example, Somalia, from Somalia to UAE, um, where you have Somalia who's going with a lot of crisis, but strengthening their system, or UAE will demonstrate that they can also have in a country who have a diversity of people coming, but able to, to capture well the COVID. What do we learn from this sector, from this system? And I think we have a lot to do as a world, but we can do it together again. Thank right. you. Right. Um, well, Dr. Balki, I mean, um, as the Assistant Director General of WHO's Division on Antimicrobial Resistance and Access to Medicine, I mean, tell us a little bit about WHO's response to emergencies. I mean, you've, WHO has been tested quite a lot over the past several years. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I will, uh, I'll definitely uh, address what you just mentioned, but maybe touch on a few other issues that were mentioned by the colleagues. So the WHO, as I mentioned, as the global uh, health organization uh, dealing with 194 countries, not only that, but we work through uh, a very complex structure of seven major offices and over 150 country offices. And that type of engagement with our member states puts us in a very strategic um, situation where we can deal and manage with the multilateralism that is extremely critical for moving forward at the country level. But there's also bits and pieces of the work that we do that are a huge part of our work, which is the normative work that we do. So I'm going to talk about maybe just a few tracks that may not be visible to the regular audience. The first part is the importance in pandemics. You're talking about pathogens that have different, as uh, our colleague Bimo said, Dr. Bimo, the different pathogenesis, different impact, different mortality rate, different transmissibility rate. So once a pathogen pops up as a cause of an epidemic or an outbreak, there's, there has to be very quick identification of all of the characteristics of this specific pathogen. And that needs to be done in cooperation with the people on the ground, in the countries, through their surveillance systems, through their diagnostic sy systems. And that's why it's very important that the work that is done at the country level is patient-centered, so that the countries themselves have their fingers on the pulse on what is happening at the country level. They know what are the pathogens that are circulating in their communities and what are the new ones that are emerging. So WHO uh, encourages very much and works with member states to strengthen the surveillance and diagnostic systems. And that's very crucial to our success. Number two is understanding the epidemiology as it's in its active phase. So without the surveillance and the networks that we're working through to understand the epidemiology 
of the COVID-19 uh, virus, we would not have been able to identify the whole genome sequencing. We would not have been identifying, I'm not saying us as WHO, but the research and development entities, the scientists, the R&D, they would not have been able to develop very quickly an effective vaccine. We would not have been able to develop very quickly therapeutics and diagnostics. So part of our work is to ensure that that mechanism continues to move forward in a very robust uh, fashion. The second, uh, and this is just, I'm just touching on the issue of data and surveillance. The second part is the work, the interagency health emergency uh, work that we do with many other uh, partners. And uh, Mr. Shamasi mentioned His Excellency on the work in delivering these kits to the countries. These kits that are developed through multilateral agencies serve each kit. We're talking about not a small kit, we're talking about huge containers, serves 10,000 individuals for three months. And over the past several weeks, I think through uh, the hub in Dubai and others, there was at least 185 metric tons of goods delivered to the different countries, and some are even landing on the ground now. Now, those kits have to have the necessary medical equipment and medications that are relevant to, the specific, to specific outbreaks and for the initial response to uh, health challenges in the context of disasters, whether it's natural or man-made. Now, within those kits, the, one of the major roles of WHO is to ensure the regulatory processes are in place and that what is in those kits are actually of quality and they're regulated and they've went through specific pre-qualification. This is a very also complex work that the WHO does. And maybe we will talk about it a little bit later, I think, in, in, in this session. The, the third part that I wanted to talk about is, again, the, the, uh, another normative part is the guidelines. Once an outbreak happens, as we saw in COVID, and a vaccine came out, what's the dose? How frequent? When do we give the second one? Who should be excluded from the vaccines? New medications came on the market. The same thing, the guidelines. What's the dose? How frequent? Pregnant women get it or not? Children get it or not? All of those guidelines are developed by the WHO through our technical expertise networks. But not only that, we've tried to be even more efficient in developing what is known as living guidelines so that the impact of the science can reach the communities in a much faster way. So these living guidelines are present on our websites where they are updated in the same time as the science is being developed. And I think um, just with also uh, Dr. Bimo mentioned the issue of the pandemic and our preparedness. So I, I want to say a few words on the new architectures that are being developed. At the, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was huge assessment of the response, whether the WHO, of course, as the center of, of global health, but I think also we've received over 300 recommendations uh, directed towards WHO, but also directed towards the multilateral organizations, towards the governments, towards, if you want to put it in the right context, the global community that needs to work together in responding to a pandemic. These 300 recommendations have led to a huge ripple effect. One of them was to revise the international health regulations, which is taking place right now, because the IHR, as many of you know it, is really to address the issue of trade and crossing borders. And that's one big challenge in, in such situations. The second one, is which was led by the Director General um, through our member state uh, governing body meetings, is establishment of a pandemic accord or a pandemic treaty. And the member states through our governing bodies had made that pandemic accord a binding treaty, and that is extremely critical. It is now time for the member states to, st to be at the table while this is being crafted, while this is being written, to put their voices in. The WHO is the organization that has equal voice to all of its 194 member states at the table, crafting, writing, and, and, and um, uh, writing down the pandemic accord, and th this is happening over the next year or so. And within that pandemic accord, the, uh, the binding part is in uh, talking about intellectual property, talking about crossing borders, talking about uh, sharing information, talking about royalties. It's going to affect all countries of all economic levels. 
So the IHR, the, Interna the Pandemic Treaty or the Pandemic Accord, and the third one that is also led by the WHO through the recommendations that came out is the Health Emergencies Pandemic Response Architecture. Many of the people at the, uh, on the panel today were part of the ACTA Accelerator or Access to uh, the access to COVID tools um, accelerator, and uh, we we were we became a, a big family working together. But that was really more of a functional or a gentleman's agreement among the organizations to expedite the communication on what needs to be done during the pandemic. That will not be sustained forever, and now we need to look at how are we as the multilateral organizations? Are we going? To, how are we going to work together? How are we going to work, work with science? And how are we going to work with our member states so that the current outbreaks and the future pandemics will be addressed in a more equitable, effective, and fast method? And I think at the heart of all of this is strengthening the healthcare systems for the resilience. Um, I'll leave some of my other comments maybe okay. for later, so thank you. That's great. Well, I'm gonna go off script a little bit, Mr. Asalte, and ask you, um, We've been talking a lot about preparedness and health system strengthening. And as a, a funder um, of, of government and um, everything, how, how, are you, how are you prioritizing preparedness and health system strengthening efforts uh, in the bank? Okay, thank you. Um, now, when it comes to the issue of addressing COVID and also other, okay, um, first, the knowledge of the countries is, is very important and again it's always you have to be always prepared and all of that now addressing the issue of COVID, the islamic development bank what we have done is immediately uh, we have developed a program we call it sprp the strategic preparedness and response program it was initially starting at 2.4 billion us dollars although we don't want to say that we were trying to address the issue of vaccines and all of that because this is more specialized to the health organization. But what we tried to do is to look into country by country. Okay, now they have shifted their priorities. So some of their developmental programs, now they have moved into health and all of that. Here is where we come in. We try to fill the gap in other social sector, basic needs like education, the creation of jobs, agriculture, development, etc., etc. And also we looked into this issue about trade, this issue about food supplies, which are important. Yes, health is very, very important. However, we try to address the other needs because unfortunately, yes, there are some well-off countries that are managing, but even middle-income countries and even low-income countries, they were really hit hard. And the issue that whatever progress we achieved in fighting poverty or bringing little, little progress, it has gone down, so we try to fill in the gap. Uh, also, another thing what we did, which is I think uh, Dr. mentioned, Dr. Hanan mentioned this issue about coordination, and again, data sharing and all of that. We, you cannot work alone. And I think this has been said also. So we have been working with partners and all of that. I give an example where we have looked into the uh, COVID response with our colleagues in the Arab Coordination Group. These are the Arab financial institutions, including Saudi Fund for Development, Abu Dhabi Fund, Kuwait Fund, Qatar Fund, Arab Fund, OPIC Fund, even Badia in, in, uh, in uh, Sudan, uh, Arab Monetary Fund, AG Fund including also the ISDB. So what we did is we came up with a quick program of $10 billion together to address the issue of the COVID and how we can help the member countries addressing their needs in whether it comes to social services, infrastructure, etc. And I'm very proud to mention that we have exceeded that target by even, we reached even about the 15 or $16 billion. From the ISDB also, it was started with 2.4, but then we got into trade, we got into insurance, we got into private sector, helping creation of jobs, SMEs, etc., etc. That way we can complement the health work that is going well, and we have increased our intervention to more than 4.5 billion in there. So these are some varieties that we have trying to, to been trying to do. Of course, you cannot do it alone. You have to talk to the MDBs, the IFIs, NGOs, private sector, again, to re-inject hope, re-inject some of the developmental needs in these member countries and helping them at least they're coping with the health situation, etc. Also, just one, one last note, which is we have to look into the issue of, of fairness and accessibility 
to health services or vaccines. Because all of us, we have witnessed, I'm sure the whole international community, they were wholeheartedly working for helping member countries. But we have seen and we have received complaints from some of the least developed member countries that the issue of the delivery of the vaccines or the health services were slowed because of either it could be accessibility, it could be financial situation, whereas some of the, I would say, the high-income countries and middle-income countries, they get it. So we really have to work as an international community to address this issue about fairness, accessibility, being prepared, etc., etc., etc. So I just end by saying in, in, in that part that, yes, aside with that we're addressing the health issue, but you cannot ignore the other thing to help the countries, otherwise they will go into total collapse. So we have to maintain the education system, we have to maintain the livelihood, we have to maintain job creation, or at least protection of jobs, uh, little economics, uh, socio-economic, etc., etc. And we continue to coordinate with our family of the MDBs, IFIs, and also the countries and the other uh, partners. Right. That's great. Um, we've really we've touched on all of the the impacts the co conflict and and climate change um and you know and then disease outbreaks i mean uh, dr ali i mean as we think about the future of humanitarian response um you know what do governments need to do to effectively prepare for that triple threat pandemics climate change and conflict uh uh thank you uh and as a government, and the fact that we have uh, now uh, we are talking as a colleague uh, from Islamic Development Bank talking about we wanted to talk about resilience more than acute humanitarian aid only. Uh, we hope that. Uh, our humanitarian partners and donor agencies, we want to realize that we need build institutions and support system building more while we also address acute humanitarian need. The need for supporting humanitarian development and peace nexus in country like Somalia cannot be overemphasized. One thing is clear, we cannot win the war against ill health, hunger, buffered, while we are neglecting health, food, nutrition, water, and environment. So we need to build a resilient health national institutions. We need to localize capacity and not substitute. We should be guided by science and evidence and the spirit of solidarity, partnership, collaboration, and coordination led by the government. We must be hopeful and not help, hopeless moving forward with targeted approach to serve the acute humanitarian need, but also build resilient institutions so that countries like Somalia can face similar crises like this on its own. Our donors should support us with funds that are flexible but have futuristic eye on inclusivity and sustainability. So uh, what we need is uh, fragile countries like Somalia facing many crises, war, drought, pandemic, diseases, lack of enough infrastructure. We wanted to, uh, most of the countries wanted to fight in emerging and in emerging infectious diseases that crossing the borders in order not to reach them. Mm -hmm. But also, we wanted to support the fragile countries to build their, their institutions right. rather than focusing humanitarian aid only. Right. Yes. Right. A dual strategy. We also, we also want uh, that government should lead and prioritize the needs um, and the humanitarian aid also. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Thank you. Right. You know, you know what your people need, and you need that dual strategy, both strengthening the health system as well as providing the humanitarian assistance. Yeah. Um, Mr. Al Shamsi, the UAE is uh, hosting uh, COP28 this year, demonstrating the role that governments like yours 
have to play in identifying solutions to challenges such as climate change. Um, I'd love for you to add your perspective. Um, can you speak a bit about the role of diplomacy and policy in shaping the future of humanitarian response? And what policy actions should we explore? Well, thank you very much. I mean, that's well, a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I think uh, it's really interconnected. The diplomacy and the policy and humanitarian action and, and yes, we need diplomacy, especially now when we speak about the Syria earthquake. Mm. We need diplomacy about increase the cross-border operation and cross-line operation. Um, just yesterday when we saw the another earthquake, so we have to activate, yes, it's backed by the UN resolution, but also we have to activate as much as we can the cross-line, cross-border operation. We use all the access. We have to increase the access. So we need the diplomacy on that. We need diplomacy also on the how we come together, how we coordination and collaborate together. It's very important. And we saw actually a big institute and, and um, organization playing an important role, like the African Union or, or Arab Leagues. Uh, the conflicts now, I think, is very important also to have like is African-American talk, to have that. So you need the diplomacy whether on the DRC, whether on the uh, South Sudan or others. Plus, that we need policies also about the allocation, how much we much disperse on the humanitarian development. We saw actually many or, uh, donor countries they are spending more than 80% of the development, which does really make sense. Around 15% just focus on humanitarian response. But it seems now, I think, there is a miss of, of uh, the early recovery. So we need a policy about how also we fill the gap and avoid any implication after remitting response. Now actually on the uh, natural crisis or the, the, the man-made crisis, I think we have to work as much as we can on the early recovery to avoid any humanitarian. We need diplomacy also on the uh, assurance of respecting the IHL on the ground. They have to respect the IHL on the ground. We, see, we saw actually as, as good now coordination of the civil military coordination on the ground. We need also the ability to back that. We have to have, because in the end, we have to reach the people in the end. We have to have more access. So I think we need to also have more diplomacy and policy also backed up. The pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, I think we learned a lot. We have to also uh, develop our new policy, how we can much prepare, how we can really respond together. Well, all the stakeholders we have, uh, we need also to, uh, uh, policies really guiding and backed all this uh, uh, assistance. Finally, I think always in the, our, our response, especially UAE, and our heart response to women is also on the center and the children as well. So how we can engage women is not about any responding, to crisis to the women, but also how engage them on the, uh, the decision-making, how to design the programs, how they can implement. So they have to have a voice uh, on this one, also, also an accountability. So this is actually a cycle that we have. They have to be in designing and implementation as women. We have really engaged many, many actually women on the, our programs. We have uh, programs when it comes to the climate change and UAE hosting the, the COP28 at the end of, of this year by November. We have really invested on the small and island states on the Pacific and Caribbean. We allocated $50 million there and another $50 million actually on the Caribbean. These islands really so fragile. We have to find a sustainable solution for them. In addition of that, we engage more women to manage these programs on the ground. That is, women uh, has to be in the heart. What's happening now in Afghanistan is really, it's not really open the education for women also, or work actually on the, the organizations. I think uh, we are missing a big opportunity if, if not really giving any education for, for the girls and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and during, during this time. Right. I mean, you make a really good point about putting, you know, the affected people at the center of the response. I mean, maybe um, Mrs. Kodor, you could talk a little bit about um, the ways that UNICEF does that. And then Valerie, perhaps you, Dr. Bimo, you could follow up with some just overview of how humanitarian 
entities should put conflict affected and communities at the center of their of their response. You you want to start, Mrs. Coder? Thank you very much, and uh, Rebecca. Mm. I think for UNICEF, of course, uh, the issue of the localization of the response is something to which we have adhered long time ago because it came in the World Humanitarian Summit and then in the Grand Bargain uh, Commitments. And in fact, in all our uh, humanitarian uh, action, we have something called the account the affected populations. I think Mr. Shamsi spoke about it, and uh, which is really at, uh, at the heart of what we do. And uh, even inside our own audits, you know, when we get an audit or a review of our uh, humanitarian action, uh, one of the things against which we are assessed internally as an organization is the issue of the accountability to the affected population. Now, concretely, what does it really mean? I think the, the first thing is that we work through the local leadership and through the existing uh, systems rather than replacing them. So it is uh, our priority all the time to see what already exists on the ground and see how to uh, strengthen it rather than how to replace it or create a parallel system. I think that's the first point. The second is about um, also respecting the local partners' capacity. And I think that uh, it was talked about that we don't look at our partners on the ground and specifically the NGOs as implementing partners. Actually, we are not calling them anymore implementing partners. We are just calling them partners because they have a say in how the work is, uh, is done. The third is the... Um, issue of looking at multi-year and long-term partnerships. And this means that we are looking also at uh, not doing something which is very quick and, and which will go with the end of that quick delivery of the, of the service. So how can we invest in something that will stay beyond the emergency uh, is something important because we will be strengthening the systems that already exist in, uh, in place. And in fact, in our preparedness activities, I mean, uh, myself, I know that even ahead of a humanitarian crisis or in anticipation, and I think yesterday there was one panel on anticipatory action, one of the um, actions that we do is to see, okay, with the local partners, what are their needs for preparedness. So increasing the preparedness uh, capacity of the partners that are on the ground is something which is also very critical. For example, I know in, in Ethiopia where I was working, we had a big partnership with the uh, Ethiopian uh, Red Cross, you know, to be able to make sure that they have the capacity in a number of uh, centers to do pre-positioning of supplies, uh, to do uh, capacity building for their staff. So all these are really uh, issues about the accountability for the affected population. And I would like to mention as well uh, the issue of the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. Many people look at it as something which is uh, separate than accountability to affected population, but I think it is part and parcel of that. And, uh, this is something that has to do with reputational risk and accountability to the people that we are uh, supposed to be serving, especially the children and women, to be able to protect them. Because most of the time we focus a lot on service delivery, but we forget protection issues. Mm -hmm. And for me, protection is a critical part of the accountability to affected populations. That's right. And Dr. Bima? Thank you so much. Um, I think... The first things I always remind us is that um, the local people who are there before the crisis, <clears throat> during the crisis and after the crisis, and they know better what they need and they know better what yeah. is necessary. I think that is the first principle. The second principle is that these people affected by different humanitarian crises are just at the wrong place at the wrong time but they all have dream, hope, like all of us. And we should go there knowing that they are human beings that actually need support, but they are not lost their dignity. I think that is the principle for us to go together 
is the, the first thing. As we think about localization, we saw with COVID-19 that the, the more we get closer to the community, the better we act really rapidly. And if we cannot bring them together at the beginning, then we struggle. We saw how it was difficult, the misinformation, the disinformation. We have to look at the community to have the solution themselves. And the, the other piece, when we talk about local partnership, we tend to see local NGO government. But you have to look at the whole stakeholder because they all are part of the solution. The private sector, they will be affected themselves or have solution. The media, we know how critical media at local level is important. The academy for the research, the innovation, the government themselves are really essential. And I think unless we start really thinking about that, we will not be able to overcome the the, the gap in the humanitarian sector is so big, we cannot cope everything. Then the people have resources. How can we harness that resources, that local knowledge? Because then we can have the, the best response. Mm -hmm. And actually we can, they will be at the front center of the response and they will be dictate what is their need. And I think um, with COVID, with the different crises, it was difficult for people to move from border to border, from places to places. And rapidly, we realized as the world that each community have to deal with themselves. Then how do we learn from that and anticipate that strengthening this community will be essential on how we can have a better world? Thank you. Well, very specifically, Dr. Balki, I mean, you know, we have uh, the priority to strengthen health systems locally and to put uh, affected populations at the center of our work. But what happens when there is no access to medicines? How does WHO step in and help with that? Thank you very much. Again, this is a very important question. You're talking uh, perhaps about several solutions when there is lack of access. And I think we also need to, to work ahead and think ahead of, of time. How do we ease that for the future? Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there could be different scenarios. One of the scenarios would be about uh, talking about stockpiling. Um, and I think stockpiles are very important when they're available for specific known diseases, uh, stockpiling within a specific country, because that specific country is known to have certain uh, pathogens that continuously emerge. Yellow fever would be a good example. Ebola would be good, a good example. Then you have stockpiling within regions, like what was, is being done for the influenza uh, potential influenza uh, outbreaks or epidemics or pandemics. They could be regional ones. But we have to remember that this part of uh, improving access also requires a lot of country preparedness uh, for them to make sure that they have the stores available, that they're able to move the medications, vaccines, or diagnostics around within their stores, that they do not go through expiration dates, and if they are regional stockpiling, that it's very important that, the, first of all, that what is being stockpiled has underwent regulatory and pre-qualification in the specific countries that are going to be using them. One of the things that we are doing a lot of work on uh, in, in, at WHO is how, and I'm moving from, from the access part to a critical piece that facilitates access, and that's regulatory. So the regulatory authorities within the countries, we're working very hard, and this is again maybe a bit of the invisible work that we do, uh, to the majority of, of, of the audience probably, but it's very critical that the regulatory authorities within the member states are strengthened. So when we talk about health system strengthening, a big piece of that is strengthening the regulatory uh, authorities so that they can um, allow for specific medications, doing the pre-qualification, putting the medications, vaccines, and medical equipment on their formularies, um, that they have regulatory focal points, which we work with very closely, because the, um, the risk here is that if you do not have that in place, then the communities will start accessing falsified and substandard medications. And uh, with His Excellency, the Minister in, uh, from Somalia, when you were talking about antimicrobial resistance, I'll use that important example. 
in communities that do not have access to effective and quality antibiotics, they will eventually uh, go to substandard or falsified antibiotics. And in using less qualified antimicrobial agents, the risk of resistance becomes higher. Another good example, if the pain medications are not regulated in a specific country, then specific um, uh, communities will not have access to pain control. They will obviously uh, require health care, surgery, and then they will be facing less uh, effective uh, treatment and less fair treatment. So I think when we talk about access, the regulatory piece becomes very important the coordination uh, becomes very important. Understanding what access are we talking about? Is it in the peace time or is it in the uh, pandemic and war time? So there's, there's a lot to be said about that, but I wanted to emphasize the stockpiling processes, creating the resilient regulatory and oversight, and also ensuring that um, there is a mechanism to ensure that the stockpiling and the access are for effective. And then the last point, which is the equity allocation. I think we had a great example during the pandemic on allocation of the COVID vaccine. And um, in a way, it, it did not move as fast as we wanted it to. It did not move as, um, as equitable as we wanted it to. But the WHO was core and, the, uh, and it, it, uh, prepared uh, with the partners the allocation framework. And with that, um, the allocation framework was to ensure that there is access to the COVID vaccine to the most critical, the elderly and the healthcare providers, because healthcare systems needed to be sustained. And it was about to provide 20% of the produced vaccine, uh, so that the produced vaccine will cover 20% of those critical entities in 194 countries. I think that's a, a live lesson that we need to go back to the table and understand how did that work or did it not work and why. Um, that will require maybe, uh, Becky, another session <laughs> another, to talk about. But I wanted panel. to touch on it here because it's extremely important for access. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we have about seven minutes left. Um, and I think I'll, I'll ask each panelist to uh, give us a sense. I mean, we've talked a lot about the challenges, but, but there's a lot of positive things that are happening. Um, and maybe, uh, Mr. Alsati, you could start with sort of what gives you hope um, for the future of of our world, I guess, more broadly. Good. Thank you very much. I think this is very important. Now, of course, um, with every challenge, there is always hope. Let me start by saying that, yes, we are over with COVID. We learned a lot, but the story did not stop there because one, if not among the few, now we have to deal with food security. Now, when you look at food security, it's a challenge for us. So here we have to look into mechanisms of increasing productivity, agricultural productivity, different crops, different mechanisms, and the sort of thing. I will not take too much time in there. And if you're talking about food security, it's just only about the food. It talks about education, bringing children healthy to, okay? So this food security issue is very, very challenging. And we should, by the way, similar to the COVID, we have gone into a program with the Arab Coordination Group, again, of a $10 billion addressing food security in three stages. Quick wins, then going back into productivity, etc., etc. Now, another challenge which you mentioned, Rebecca, which is climate change. And, of course, uh, by the way, I'm not an expert in this area, but if we're talking about climate change, it's everything. It's about famine, it's about desertification, it's about lack of water, it's about lack of food, you name it. Even this natural disaster, they're all uh, linked to, to the, the climate change issue. So what we did during the COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh recently, the bank has announced a program of over $13 billion to address the issue about climate change, adaptation, etc. And we have set a target for us that by 2025, our projects, 35% has to be green finance. And this is challenging, but we have reached almost 33% between between now. With the Arab Coordination Group, again, by the way, I speak highly about the Arab Coordination Group, the one of the most successful partnership, of course, our work with the, our colleagues in the uh, IFIs, MDBs, all of that, but we value the relationship with the Arab Coordination Group. We also we put a target of 24 billion between now and 2030 to address the issues of climate change activities, etc., etc. Now, let me, so, 
there is with this challenge there is always hope that you can bring solution you have commitment you change even uh, yourself so i would say that it's a three part internal at the country level at the global level internally we as an mdb istb and others we have to develop the policies we have to prepare the plans for addressing another crisis on the so this issue of fragility resilience has to be there at the country level you have to develop policies we have to have the countries and also this issue about capacity building it's very very important i give two quick examples we have an anti-blindness program in africa where we have volunteer doctors go help countries and we did many cataract operations as i mentioned to you yesterday okay we don't leave we do the operations which cost a little i need 24 dollars or something but we capacity building we train the doctors and the nurses and all of that to take the job over in yemen i give this example frequently at one time unfortunately the situation there money was not a problem in yemen as far as development, it was the issue of capacity. It was the issue of, of the absorbed capacity, the implementation, etc. So this is at the country level, we have to develop policy. And finally, at the global level, we have to work together. We have to develop plans, coordination mechanism, and platforms. By the way, we go to a country, I don't know what the, the others are doing on the ground, and we'll be hitting each other in the corridors. Right. So this issue about coordination, making sure that we have plans, complementarity, the, 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 the funding challenges is, is, is really huge. So if we don't coordinate and work together and do more comprehensive outlook and all of that, I think we fail ourselves and we fail our member countries. Right. Thank right. you. Well, Mr. Al Shamsi, what about you? What gives you hope for the future? We, we have a lot of challenges, really. I mean, I mean uh, we start with a crisis, we find another crisis, but I think. Uh, Always we see all the crisis now on the very important for the political leaders. And always the humanitarian agenda on the table, which is really that is, is important. Yes, we need more funding, we need more action, but I mean, we see officials going to the crisis. I mean, our foreign minister uh, went to uh, Syria uh, to see the, the damages by the earthquake, then also to Turkey. Um, uh, we allocated uh, money to this crisis, but also we sending uh, uh, flights, eight flights a day to Syria, and we continue to our our bridge. Also, as we see it, also a hope. Uh, um, we see the more organ countries really move to the more flexible funding. Mm -hmm. They are using different instruments like SER for the Emergency Response Fund. So uh, I think it's, we need also more like flexible funding, at least for the first to respond. Then, of course, with the, the, until the, the uh, launch, the whatever appeal for the crisis. Also, we see at the international level, uh, yes, the, the RC system has been introduced just a couple of years ago. We see yes, uh, difficulties, but I see with improvement. It's giving more independent for the RC and humanitarian coordinator on the ground. Uh, we, we see movement from the, the organization move to more on the field, not to the headquarters with New York or Geneva. We see more on the grounds. This is really very important. And also what we see it also, uh, the, 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 the big issues that really tackles the climate change, uh, the technology is being introduced. It's not really, you can't, like it's identified as the one goal of the SDGs. It's really more cross-cutting issues I mean, the climate, the technology, the women, there's really more cross-cutting issues that we also we have to tackle. Um, I mean, Somalia is really um, a, a real climate change, you will see, South Sudan, Sahel area, uh, areas been liberated on, on, from Shabab group with Dar Har Shabili or West uh, Somalia. It's very important to immediately to start the stabilization programs. Right. What we have done actually, and uh, areas been liberated by Daesh, immediately we start the stabilization. The mechanism is already there. Now it's really implementing on the Lake Chad and also on the areas like it's liberated from, from Shab Group. So I think there is a system now uh, really very advanced, and this is what we really to invest more. Great. Okay, well quickly, uh, Dr. Ali, um, we'll go to you, then Dr. Balki, and, and, and then to Mrs. Coder and Dr. Bimo, really quick. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I have talked that um, 8 million of Somali population now are in need of a humanitarian aid. I have talked that uh, climate changes and five consecutive failed rainy seasons of drought caused uh, more than uh, uh, 1 million of internal displaced people. Uh, I have talked that two-thirds of Somali people are uh, uh, less than two dollars per day uh, live by less than two dollars per day which means 69 percent of Somali population are under line of buffer we hope in the future uh, and we aim to reduce the buffer by 2030 we hope uh, although we are struggling uh, war against the terrorist also, we are at the forefront fighting against the drought, climate change, uh, pandemics, recurrent outbreaks. And at the same time, we hope now to focus, uh, to build resilient system, uh, rather than dependent of humanitarian, acute humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. We hope our partners and donor agencies to support us to build resilient national health institutions uh, to focus uh, and, uh, national and, uh, and, uh, uh, and development system. Uh, we hope that uh, and not to be dependent only to humanitarian aid, but we need to build uh, institutions, support system building, and also we wanted to fight against the ill health, hunger, buffer, uh, and not like that health, food, nutrition, water, and environment. So uh, we are inspiring better future, uh, although challenges are more, uh, and we are inspiring for better future and we hope to overcome all these challenges yes, by the support you. of our friends, donor agencies, and humanitarian support and aid. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Balki. Thank you very much. Um, as a closing, I think I wanted to reflect on uh, my career that was around now 25 years, where, and I'm an infectious disease person, so I've always been in the front line when it came, when I was in Saudi practicing on outbreaks and MERS and SARS and H1N1 and all, all those good ones. <laughs> and I think every time we kind of go through an amnesia. And I think this pandemic, the fact that it affected the whole globe and the fact that it was not an influenza pandemic, it was a novel virus, it really pushed us all uh, to work together. And I think that's probably the positive thing in this collaboration, in the multilateralism, in putting the pandemic treaty on the table and looking at the, uh, the HEPR. I think all of these are positive things. The question is how much of this pandemic will we learn from and how much of it will we really put forward the necessary um, pieces to prepare us for the future. What I do hope for in, in, in your question on in the future is how are we going to continue to engage the political leaders? As uh, Mr. Shamsi said, I think that's crucial, but not just the political leader, the financial leaders to ensure that the investment in health and resilience continues to move forward. And I think the other thing that we need to focus on a lot, um, and I'm hoping for, is the issue of equity and dissociating the situation of an individual, whether they are in a specific community, but regardless of where they are, regardless of who they are, that they are able to access uh, healthcare systems and the tools needed to keep them healthy. Yeah, thank you. Mrs. Coder? Yes, thank you very much. I think a lot was said and I will just maybe highlight two, uh, two points. I think the first one is the need that to have global solutions for these global problems and I think we are really inspired by the fact that there is so much, uh, I think, solidarity from the international community in dealing with these problems. 
but maybe two points that I would like to say. I think first, there are many crises in the world that don't make it anymore to the media. Right. And that doesn't mean that they are over. And I think we have a lot of them in the region of the Middle East and, and North Africa. And the second point, and with all appreciation, I think, for all our partners that are really supporting us in our work, and I think this is what the High Commissioner yesterday spoke about, uh, Filippo, the issue of flexible funding, because mm -hmm. it enables us, when it is at the beginning of the crisis, you know, to immediately be able to respond and to avoid many problems that could even increase further in the future and cost more to be able to solve them. So I would say those two points, and maybe the last one is the one about really political action to end a lot of these crises that right. are intertwined. Thank right. you. Dr. Vimo, the last word. <laughs> An optimistic person. Yes. And, and yesterday, one of my colleagues reminded me why I decided to do humanitarian 20 years or plus again. It's because I believe in humanity. Mm -hmm. I believe in the human people and uh, that as long as we breathe, we have the capacity to make change and to do better. And uh, for me, crisis presents us an opportunity to innovate, to be creative, to build better, faster, innovative and more resilient. And as we sit here in, the, in Saudi Arabia, the, the land of the Mecca, where we know each year people come from diverse background, diverse economic, but they come for the one aim. And I think we need to learn from being together, from one aim. And uh, if God did not give us on us, who are we to give up? Then I think I believe in humanity. Thank you. What a great note to end on. Thank you so much, everyone, for your expertise, and we're, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much.